Becky and I were graciously invited to dinner at uh, a church member's house last weekend, and we had a wonderful time, but it did remind me of a story about this young couple who invited their pastor over to their house for dinner. And while they were in the kitchen preparing the meal, the pastor leaned across the table to the young boy and said, what's for dinner? And he said, goat. And the pastor says, goat, are you sure? And he goes, well, yeah, we were driving home to church. And they said, we're having, don't forget, we're having a goat for dinner tonight. <laughs> Grab your Bibles. Here. There we go. <coughs> Here we go. All right, we're going to do our Wesley's Covenant prayer. Follow along with me. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, a wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. Who remembers the movie... Go ahead, and we're going to, in your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Joshua uh, chapter 5. We're going to be talking Joshua chapter 5 today. It's about the uh, fall of Jericho, and it's about the groundbreaking event of God's new kingdom. And we're going to get there in a kind of a fun way. Who all remembers the movie Karate Kid? Right? Everyone remembers Karate Kid. That's from 1984. How'd that make you feel? So those of you that don't know about the movie Karate Kid, it's about this high school boy named Daniel, and he wants to learn karate. Can you turn me down just a little bit back there? He wants to learn karate. Um, so he has this, meets this karate master named Mr. Miyagi. But if he wants to learn karate from Mr. Miyagi, he has to learn to do it Mr. Miyagi's way. And let me just say that Mr. Miyagi had a very strange way of teaching his pupils karate. Instead of actually teaching him karate, Mr. Miyagi used Daniel to do all his household chores. He'd have him wash and wax his car. He'd have him sand the floors. He'd have him paint the house. And Daniel got very frustrated and says, I don't understand. Why are you all doing this to me? And that's when he realized he learned karate. How many all remember Wax on, wax off. You all remember that? Wax on, wax off? Okay, now I'm going to test you. Do you remember? No, oh, this one first? Sand floor. Sand floor. What's this one? Paint house. Right? Paint the fence. That's right. That's right. So by doing chores for Mr. Miyagi, Daniel learns that... Uh, all the things that he needs to know about karate. How about you all? Have you ever learned something in a really obtuse way? You ever had some type of learning experience and you go, wow, I never thought that that's where this was going to end up. Well, I was going to learn this from that. Right? When we were kids, I know a lot of us, our parents or our grandparents, they taught us their way to track a deer, or maybe to uh, uh, plant a straight row of seeds, or maybe even to pick the right kinds of mushrooms. We don't want to be eating the wrong kinds of mushrooms. So we learn to put our faith and confidence in those that are teaching us. Sometimes those ways they want to teach us are really kind of far-fetched. But if we hang in there, as crazy it might be, we discover that there was intent and purpose to how our fathers taught us. 
So we get to a story in Scripture this morning. We're going to be reading how God does some really unusual things to build his kingdom. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13, we're outside the fortress walls of Jericho. And Joshua is looking up at this gated walls of the, of the city, and he's thinking, how are we going to breach these walls? How are we going to get through this fortress? And it's important that they accomplish this task because he knows that God promised the, pro- the promised land to the nation of Israel. And this is the doorway to the land of Canaan and the promised land. Exodus 6, this is the promise that was made to Moses. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. God made that promise to Moses 42 years earlier. And here's the important part. This is the second time God has tried to inaugurate his kingdom in Canaan. You all remember what happened the first time. Moses sent those 12 spies to go check it out, see what they need to do to come up with a battle plan. And they get back and tell them to say, there is no way. Grasshoppers are this big, the grapes are this big around, and the men are giants. We could not defeat them. So Moses says, if there's no will, we won't go to battle. If you don't do what God asks you to do, he's going to punish you. And so they were left to roam the desert for 40 years. Disobey God and bad things happen. If you can't read it, it's the, uh, the tribes wandering through the desert and in the back it's saying, recalculating, recalculating, <laughs> recalculating. And Moses is saying, knock it off. <laughs> They didn't have GPS back in those days. They literally left to wander the desert. So here we are 40 years later after this first try that that God wanted them to do. And Joshua is looking at these walls, trying to figure out a way to destroy the fortress. When we get to verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or our enemies? And Joshua gets a big surprise, because the man says, Neither. And Joshua's probably thinking, What do you mean, neither? You're like some mercenary warrior, right? You've got to be for us, you've got to be them. I mean, this isn't Switzerland. No one's neutral here. Neither, he replied, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have come now. He just tells Joshua, I am the army. I am the commander of all the forces. And Joshua fell face down to the ground of reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? We've been in the sermon series the last two weeks called Where God Finds You. And hopefully you all have been starting to think about where is God finding you each day? Where did he find you in the beginning? Where is he finding you in the morning? Where is he finding you and what's on your heart when you go to sleep at night? Where is God finding you? He finds Joshua standing outside the walls, wondering what he's going to do. But Joshua is not like Jacob, who we talked about, was afraid of Esau and his 40 men. Joshua is not like Gideon, hiding in a hole from the Midianites. Joshua is standing there with the army ready to go, ready to go into battle, ready to do whatever he has to do to destroy the walls and get inside to inaugurate the kingdom of God. 
He's ready. He's working on his final battle plans. He tells Joshua first, take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy. And Joshua did. Joshua just got checked. And then he says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and all its fighting men. Now it's important to remember, Joshua was one of those 12 spies that came back. He was one of the two, along with Caleb, that says, no, we have to go in. So he was kept alive for the 40 years. For 40 years, Joshua has been itching for this fight. For 40 years, Joshua has been trying to help lead the tribes of Israel back and into the promised land. And God tells him, march around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. And Joshua's going, what? This is your plan? I, I, you know, we're, we're going to get some battering rams and knock the doors down. And I've got 5,000 men with grappling hooks and we're going to climb the walls. Have seven priests carry trumpets of rams, horns in front of the ark. Wait, 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 you're wanting us to walk around? How are you ever going to get in? On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them sound the long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. And the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Joshua has been a military general. He knows what it takes to destroy a city, get into a city. For 40 years, he's been thinking about this battle, and God says, check yourself, Joshua. You're not doing this. I am. Check your pride. Show some humility and lead your men the way I want you to walk. Joshua's being put to a test. So how does he do? Joshua goes to his generals. He goes to his priests and said, I know it sounds crazy, but this is what we're going to do. In verse 20, we see it says that when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave the loud shout, the wall collapsed. Obey God, you win your battles. Disobey God, you lose your life. Let me say that again. Obey God, you win your battles. Disobey God, you lose your life. And Joshua conquered the promised land. God's promise to Abraham and Isaac and Moses was fulfilled. God's chosen people now lived in the promised land. By all measures, everything Joshua did to conquer the lands was a success. The people were living in the promised land. He lived 110 years, and then he dies. And last week, we talked about the void, the vacuum leadership void that was left when Joshua was there no more. We talked about the book of Judges and how everything that Joshua did to build God's kingdom became like Jericho. It came crashing down. You know, the Old Testament... It ranges from Adam all the way to Malachi. 
4,000 years of history. 4,000 years of God's covenant with his people, the rise and fall of kingdoms, exile, restoration, and ultimately the absence of God. When the Old Testament ends with the prophet Malachi, God goes quiet for 400 years. Maybe he said, I've had enough. Maybe he thought, I need four centuries of new generations before they'll ever be ready. But then one day, unexpectedly, God did something new. He decides to come down and build the kingdom himself. In the Gospel of Luke, we've got this, this wonderful story, this entirely complete story of Jesus from his birth to his teachings to his death on the cross and his resurrection. And during his ministry, Jesus modeled the life of, of a perfect, obedient, compassionate servant to God. He was the quintessential role model for how we are to be then and now. He walked before us as the example of what to emulate. Yet we're never obedient children, are we? So being fully God and being fully human he offered to pay the ultimate sacrifice for the penalty of our sins. He willingly went on that cross to die so that we may live. So that he could defeat death. So that once again, this kingdom of God could once again reign fully on earth. The last six chapters of the book of Luke is what scholars call the passion narrative. And these six chapters, they outline in great detail the last two weeks of Jesus' life. The reunion with Lazarus and Martha and Mary. The meal with the disciples, the betrayal, and then the back and forth, back and forth that ends up with him dying on the cross. And then the story tells us about on the third day, the tomb is empty. He's resurrected and he appears before the disciples and he eats a piece of fish. That is called the passion story. That is called the story that leads to the inauguration of the new kingdom of God. Chapters 19 to 24. Let me show you how chapter 19 begins. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. We didn't get it right the first time. So he starts the new inauguration of this new kingdom right where they left off in Jericho. Once again, God decides he's going to rebuild his kingdom. He's challenging us to follow his techniques battling evil in the world. Jesus wants to teach us this new radical form of martial arts to defend ourselves against the evil. But instead of wax on, wax off, he tells us to feed the hungry and volunteer at the shelters. Instead of sand floor, we're to come alongside those children that are abandoned or abused. Instead of paint house, we're supposed to go seek the lost and bring them to Christ. That's the new martial arts. It's a revolutionary path that Jesus set before us. 
So the question before all of you today is, are you ready to follow Jesus' example? Are you ready to lift up the kingdom of God? Will we be obedient even when God's ways seem really unusual? Joshua had to let go of all his battle strategies and treat, completely trust God. And when he did that, he was victorious. How about you? Are you ready to set aside your ways for God's way? Because God's ways are not our ways. They are the path to true, lasting victory. Will you commit to feeding the hungry, caring for the marginalized, and, and seeking the lost, not in your own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit? That's your training to live in the kingdom of God. This is the new martial art that Jesus calls for us to learn and to practice. This is the new wax on, wax off. Just like the walls of Jericho, this world is crumbling. Now's the time for us to join Jesus and rebuild his kingdom. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have an abundant life, the eternal life, on earth as it is in heaven. Let's devote ourselves to God's kingdom work, no matter how unconventional it might be. As a church, let's lock arms and march forward, trusting in God's power to lead us. Let's be the community that embraces God's compassion, Jesus' servant heart. That thing that brings hope and transforms everyone we touch. The world is changing. We can be a positive change that Christ wants and needs to build his kingdom. All the old kingdoms built by human effort are crashing down. But the kingdom of God, built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, will stand forever. Amen. On the last Sunday of each month, I like to just pause and let people have an opportunity to examine your relationship with Jesus. To give you a chance to figure out where you are in your relationship to the Lord and Savior. If you've been feeling a stirring in your heart, like God's calling you to step up and you're not sure what to do next, I'm inviting you to come forward this morning and let God talk to you and let's understand how he wants to be a part of your life. If you're feeling called to deepen your relationship with God, to really follow Jesus and live out your faith, I'm inviting you to come forward this morning. Let's talk about how Jesus wants to be a part of your life. If you've been on the fence about becoming a part of this congregation and, and Jesus is pushing you to take that step, then come forward this morning and meet the rest of your family. It's easy to get caught in the busyness of life and, and not feel those little nudges of God tugging at you. Open your heart. And commit to taking whatever steps it takes because he's calling you. Let this morning be the start of your response to the call. And as we begin to sing the song, leaning on the everlasting arms. Lean into the yoke of Christ. Come be who we want you to be. Take that leap of faith. Do something out of the ordinary and come forth.